Back in October 1984, a young girl vanished from the small town of Queensville, Ontario. It was quickly apparent that Christine Jessup hadn't just wandered off, she had been taken. With few leads and limited evidence to go on, authorities focused on one man, crossing their fingers that he was the one responsible. Two trials later, he was found guilty. They didn't know it then, but the real killer was still out there. It wasn't until 2020, 35 years after Christine was last seen, that we finally found out the truth. Christine Marion Jessup was born on November 29, 1974, to parents Janet and Robert Jessup. She had an older brother, Kenneth, or Kenny, as he was known. The Jessups raised their children in the quiet village of Queensville, Ontario. It was the ideal place to raise a family. The close-knit community had just 600 residents, and the low crime rate made it a safe place to live. But that idea of safety would be shattered in the years to come. Those who knew Christine described her as a sweet and caring young girl who loved animals, her favorite being her beagle, Freckles. Christine loved to play and had an array of stuffed animals. When she wasn't dreaming up exciting stories for her toys inside her bedroom, Christine was outside in the sunshine, climbing trees and enjoying her surroundings. One of Christine's most prized possessions was her bike. She loved pedaling up and down the street, laughing as she went. Christine always put her bike away carefully, never tossing it aside where it might get damaged. Wednesday, October 3rd, 1984, started like any other day. The children woke up early, dressed, and had breakfast before heading to school. Janet never had to chase Christine out the door since she always looked forward to her time at school. Nine-year-old Christine was in the fourth grade and attending the nearby Queensville Public School. Janet was taking Kenny to visit his father, who was in jail for a minor fraud charge. Janet didn't want her daughter to see a place like that, so Christine would take the bus home. While at school, Christine organized with a close friend, Leslie Chipman, to meet at the park with their dolls after school. Christine got off the bus sometime between 3.40 and 4 p.m. When Leslie got home, she watched TV with her brother before leaving home at around 4 p.m. to meet Christine at the park. When she arrived, Christine was not yet there. Leslie assumed her friend was on her way and stayed a while longer to wait, but Christine never came. Leslie walked back home and called the Jessup home at 4.10 p.m. There was no answer. Leslie waited another 10 minutes before calling again, and this time, someone picked up. It was Kenny who told Leslie that Christine wasn't home. Janet and Kenny had gotten home sometime between 4.10 and 4.20 p.m. Christine wasn't in the house, but it was apparent she had been. The mail had been brought in from outside and placed next to her backpack on the kitchen table, which Christine often did if she was the first home. There was something undeniably suspicious, though. Christine's bike was lying flat on the floor over the pathway to the house. This struck Janet as odd. She knew what good care Christine took of her bike, but this wasn't enough to cause an immediate panic. Janet assumed her daughter had gone off to play with one of her friends, and she decided to give Christine time to walk back through the door. Unfortunately, that never happened. When dinner time was fast approaching, and with Christine still not home, Janet decided to call some of the neighbors in case she was with them. This was unusual for Christine, but maybe she had just gotten lost in time. When no one she called had seen her daughter, Janet's concerns quickly grew. After going out with Kenny to look for her with no luck, Janet called the police. The York Regional Police took the missing persons report and quickly assembled a team focused on finding Christine. Establishing a timeline to figure out where she could have gone was essential. They knew Christine had made it home from the bus with the mail and her backpack inside the home. After speaking to several witnesses, investigators learned that Christine was spotted walking from the Jessup home toward Main Street between 4 and 4.30 p.m. She knew this path well. There was a corner store that Christine and Kenny regularly visited to buy candy. It was also on the way to the park. Authorities now needed to try and figure out where Christine was last seen and where she disappeared from. It was likely somewhere between these three points, her home, 
the store, and the park. The possibility of Christine running away was quickly ruled out, and her disappearance was soon classed as an abduction. The investigators working on this case had their work cut out for them from the start. They didn't have a crime scene or an abduction site. No witnesses could tell them about a person acting strangely or seen talking to Christine. With this limited evidence and few leads, they turned their eyes to one man, Guy Paul Moret. Guy was a neighbor of the Jessops. He was 23 years old and lived with his parents. When he wasn't working at a furniture company, Guy played in a band with some friends. He had a girlfriend and stayed in a close circle, and he was not an outgoing extrovert type. But Guy had no criminal history. From the outside, nothing pointed to him being the kind of person to abduct a child. Since he kept to himself, a few people in Queensville described Guy as strange. This coupled with the fact that a search dog had supposedly signaled to the Moray family vehicle further fueled the investigator's idea that Guy was potentially involved. The Moray's were more than happy to allow authorities to search their vehicle. Nothing significant was found, but several fibers were taken into evidence for analysis. So, where had Guy been when Christine disappeared? It turned out his alibi was rock solid. His time card at work showed him clocking out at 3.32 p.m. After finishing work, Guy stopped at a store and purchased a lottery ticket. The clerk confirmed he had been there. His next stop was the grocery store before filling the car with gas. He was home somewhere between 5 and 5.30 p.m. His brother-in-law confirmed this. Guy spent the rest of his evening at home, napping before helping his dad with maintenance work. Despite his alibi and the multiple people who could back it up, the police were still working on placing Guy at the crime scene. Sadly, days turned into weeks and months without any sign of Christine. The case slowed down with still no concrete leads or new evidence. The Jessops had to celebrate Thanksgiving, Christine's 10th birthday, and Christmas without her. Tragically, the search ended on New Year's Eve, six days later. On December 31st, Christine's body was found on the edge of a field in Sunderland, 25 miles east of Queensville. This spot was between York and Durham, which meant the Durham police got involved. It was a disturbing scene. Christine's remains were badly decomposed, and she was found lying on her back with her legs open. She only had a beige turtleneck and blouse on. Her pants, belt, and shoes were piled near her feet. The autopsy later revealed Christine had been badly beaten and stabbed multiple times to her upper body. It was a vicious attack. Christine had also been sexually assaulted, and DNA from the killer was found on her underwear, but DNA at the time was still in its infancy. Still, this was held on record and would later be the final puzzle piece that solved this case. Following Christine's funeral, the Jessops visited where her body had been found. While there, they discovered four small bones. It turned out that these had been missed and belonged to Christine. The Durham Regional Police eventually took over the investigation. When the two agencies met, the York Police had one primary bit of advice for the Durham investigators. Look at Guy Paul Moret, and look at him, they did. Roughly five months after Christine was discovered, and after multiple interviews with police, Guy was arrested in April 1985. The investigators claimed he made a few references that could indicate he knew details about the site where Christine was found and exhibited odd behavior. A trial followed. Prosecutors painted Guy as a loner, obsessed with his young neighbor. They said the fibers found in the Moray family car matched a sweater owned by Christine, and a hair found on her body was reportedly matched to Guy. To top it off, the prosecution had two informants happy to testify that Guy had confessed to the crime while in jail. Guy's defense lawyer protested his client's innocence, but also did something rather strange. 
he entered a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity, stating that Guy could have schizophrenia and could have committed the crime during an episode. Surprisingly, in the end, Guy was acquitted. The prosecution wasn't going to lie down though. They appealed this decision with the Supreme Court of Canada, and a new trial date was set. At Guy's second trial, his defense was much stronger. They revealed that police had not turned over all necessary reports before the previous trial and had other proof that much of the evidence and statements against Guy Moret had been fabricated. Despite this, Guy was found guilty this time around in July 1992. Fast forwarding to 1995, Guy's defense team was granted an appeal, and this time he had DNA on his side. A lab in Massachusetts was able to develop a DNA signature, something that was previously not possible. The DNA did not belong to Guy Moret. They had the wrong guy. In the aftermath, Kenny revealed that police had him lie about his timeline. Instead of finding the person who fit the limited evidence, the investigators had been intent on making the evidence fit Guy Moret. He would eventually be granted $1.2 million in damages for wrongful prosecution. The investigation was now at a complete standstill, and it had been like this for many years. When Guy was found innocent, 11 years had passed since Christine's murder. The Toronto Police Department took over Christine's case. Slowly but surely, it went cold. The years trickled by, with Christine's family living with the fact that her killer was still out there. Suddenly, it was 2020, and a shock announcement was made on October 15th. Following a renewed look at her murder, investigators contacted a genetic genealogy lab in Texas to see whether they could track down the man responsible through his relatives. Who is the monster responsible? Calvin Hoover. Hoover was 28 years old when he killed Christine. He was married to Heather, a woman who worked with Christine's dad. The Hoovers and the Jessops knew each other and occasionally socialized. On October 1st, Christine and Kenny went to the Hoover's home with their mom. While there, Janet mentioned visiting Bob in jail in two days. There is a high likelihood that Calvin overheard this, knowing that Christine would be home alone. Following her disappearance, Hoover participated in the search efforts and even attended her funeral with Heather. But would there be justice? Sadly, not. Calvin Hoover took his own life in 2015 never having to face up to what he did. It's hard to say whether investigators would have connected the dots to Hoover back in the early days of the investigation had they not been so focused on Guy Moret. Others have speculated that Hoover may have been responsible for more than just Christine's death, believing that someone who would commit a crime so gruesome would likely not just stop. While Christine Jessup's family now knows who was responsible, they will never see him brought to justice or be able to face the man who killed their beautiful daughter.